Hello and welcome to part 2 of the Macintosh Portable Restoration. In this video, we're going to be doing the recap. Now, pretty much every vintage Mac in existence is plagued with this issue, where old capacitors will start leaking and they will start ruining and damaging other components of their electrolyte fluid. Basically, the way capacitors are made is the bottom part is made out of a rubber, which over time degrades and eventually it'll start leaking all this electrolyte fluid, which is extremely corrosive, and it'll start damaging traces, components, and anything else, and even itself. There's a mixture of surface mount capacitors and through-hole capacitors on this board. There are a handful of different types of capacitors, so I'm going to be order the, ordering them online. The site that I'm ordering my capacitors on is DigiKey. Now, DigiKey is a good site for ordering anything electronic related, and basically they sell capacitors and you can enter all the specifics for the caps you need, and you can order them, and they come in small little bags. Now, the, the Macintosh Portable has a bunch of capacitors, and normally axial capacitors don't go bad, which are the blue ones, but I'm going to be replacing all of them anyway. I'm even going to be replacing these axial capacitors that usually don't leak, but I'll be replacing them anyway. So yeah, we got these. Uh, we got this one capacitor here. We got uh, we got this. Uh, we got some more caps. Uh, we also have some surface mount caps that we have to replace. And then for some reason, I also got this, which is literally this is literally just six capacitors in a big freaking reel. Like, what is even this? This all this is this, this whole reel is useless. Honestly, I don't know why I was sent this. All right, let's fire up the soldering station. The station that I'm using is a combination of a soldering iron and a hot air station. The hot air station is very useful for taking off the surface mount caps, but that's about it. Now before recapping, I like to take a bunch of high resolution photos of the board. This will help me identify which capacitors I need to remove, which ones to replace, which orientation they go in, just in case I put any of them in backwards, which is unlikely, but it's always good to make sure. This is also a good guide for reference, just in case you don't know which orientation they go in. So we're going to start off with these axial capacitors. Now the thing about these is that they're actually oriented in a, in a horizontal orientation rather than the regular vertical orientation that they, that they normally go into. These are polarized caps, which is why they have the band, so you have to make sure that the arrows on the band are pointing the right direction. Now the arrows are always pointing to the negative side, and the board is actually clearly marked which side is positive and which side is negative, which is helpful. Now, let's start off with taking off the capacitor. I'm going to turn over the board and locate the two pins that I'm going to have to desolder. Next up, I'm going to add some flux to the pins. Now, if you don't know what flux is, flux basically makes the job a lot easier. It makes the solder go a lot faster. And, it's so, and it makes the job so much easier. And I definitely recommend picking some up if you ever decide to solder one day. It's very helpful and soldering without flux is a huge pain. So I'm t now I'm gonna take out my solder wick. Now basically what solder wick does is when it's heated up, it sucks up the solder, which is very helpful for taking out components. I do also wanna note that I'm using a chiseled tip on my soldering iron because it transfers heat a lot better in certain situations like this. I recommend having a fan in close proximity to wherever you're soldering because this type of stuff definitely causes a lot of smoke, which is very cancerous to inhale and smells really bad, so it's nice to have that just to blow it out of the way. One last thing I want to note, I am in no means a professional at soldering, I just know how to do it. If you want to learn how to solder and you want to become a professional or just a good solderer in general, I recommend checking out Bruce Rain's channel called Brankus Creations. He does a lot of cool soldering stuff and has a cool vintage Mac collection. And he's very good at soldering and that's where I got most of my knowledge from. So go check him out if you're interested in learning how to solder. All right, so once the solder is all gone, the component should lift right out of the board. The steps for the rest of the through hole caps are exactly the same. You add flux, you use wick to take out the solder, and then finally you lift it out of the machine. I do want to note that the flux will leave some gross sticky residue, so the best thing I like to do is get an, some alcohol on a Q-tip and just wash it clean. Now Bruce actually uses an ultrasonic cleaner to clean his boards when he's finished with three caps, but unfortunately I don't have an ultrasonic cleaner because they're a bit expensive. They do work a lot better though in this kind of situation. Now I'm finished with removing all the through hole caps 
off of the board. Now before moving on, it's best to clean out the electrolyte fluid from underneath the through hole caps. Now, usually there are traces underneath these capacitors that can get damaged if the electrolyte is still there. So it's best to remove them with alcohol and a Q-tip. Moving on to the surface mount capacitors. Now I remove these a bit differently. Instead of soldering like the traditional way, I like to use a better method, which is using a hot air station. Luckily, I've been blessed and I have a soldering station with a hot air station installed as well. So I'm gonna be removing these surface mount capacitors capacitors like this. Now you'll notice that I'm putting this razor blade or shield um, to protect the other components and this is because the hot air can interfere with other components and possibly melt or burn them. So it's a good idea to have a sort of shield like this and using razor blades with springs to prop them up is the best solution in my opinion. Now you'll notice the surface mount capacitors will pop when you heat them up which is normal and they will all do that. Sometimes the pops can be very scary and terrible, so you have to be sure that you're wearing some kind of protective gear on your eyes, because if it gets in your eyes, it will sting like crazy. You also want to be careful not to accidentally rip or tear a pad off of the board. Pads are basically these two little metal prongs that you solder the capacitors to, and if you, have, and if you rip one, you're doomed. I don't actually have any experience with repairing pads because I've never damaged one before, so I'm going to try as much as possible to try not to remove them. Now taking a look at the pads, you can see how bad the corrosion is from the capacitors. To fix this, I'll use some Q-tips and alcohol once again. This usually cleans off all the corrosion, which is very helpful. Sometimes you might find a broken trace, but if you do, I recommend you'll have to try fixing it, because that could be an issue with your computer. Now we're going to have to remove the old solder, because it isn't as conductive as new solder. So basically the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to add flux to every single pad, and then I'm going to start removing the solder and adding solder and removing some solder, so I can make the pads totally clean and shiny. You have to be very careful with this step because pushing down too hard on the wick or rubbing it too much can result in pushing a pad off or lifting it. So you want to be very careful and use just enough force that is required. Alright, now it is time to apply the new caps. Now you're going to have to add a layer of flux on the pads before adding the caps. This will help them this will help the solder flow quicker and it'll also help keep them in place. It's a bit easier than putting them on and then putting the flux on. Make sure they are facing the correct direction. Now what I've done here is I've just put one cap on and then I'm going to connect it because having all the caps on at once will make it hard because they'll get in the way. Basically what I'm doing is I'm just adding some solder on the tip of my iron and then lightly tapping on the terminals of the capacitor to connect it. Make sure and make sure and verify that the cap will not wiggle around, otherwise it will not work. Alright, so now we're going to apply the through hole capacitors. Now unfortunately these capacitors have bent pins, which means that they won't sit perfectly flush on the board. So I'm going to try bending these pins back. I also want to note that if your cap will not fit through the holes, you might have to wick it out a bit more. Here you can see the cap will not fit flush on the board because the pins are bent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten these pins so that they sit perfectly flush because it looks a lot better. Next thing I did was flip the board over and bent the pins of the cap. This prevents it from falling out while working on it. I'm going to add some more flux again and then I'm going to solder the pins onto the board. That I proceeded to do that with every single cap on the board until everything was done. God guys, it actually seems to be working now. So you can see, you could probably not, you probably can't tell, but the, in person the screen flicker is gone. Uh, the trackball's acting up again, but I plugged in, oh no, now it's frozen, but it does seem to boot up every time without sad max but it does not like using the hard drive it does a happy chime but when i plug in the hard drive it just gives me sad stuff so 
I don't think the hard drive will make it out alive in this repair, but maybe that's another power issue that I can fix. Maybe it's that uh, power thingy that looks crusty on the board. But yeah, this is after the uh, uh, recap, and I did actually find like a damaged trace, which I think was from me. And it, and originally I tried powering up um, after the recap without with the damaged trace, and it wouldn't boot up like this. It wouldn't stay on for more than five seconds, but now it does. And look, you can see the cursor works. You can see this works and I can actually boot it off of this floppy system disk which is like the worst crustiest disk that I have in my collection which looks like this and it'll actually work come on nope yep there it goes you can hear it go and it gives me the uh, welcome to Mac screen oh and it does that occasionally I don't know why but I think it should boot up this time, but I actually did get it to the desktop. And I have a picture of that, but I'm honestly astounded that I was able to get this far. And that's frozen again. Okay, there we go. But yeah, I'll update on some more things that come up. Uh, so yeah. All right, so quick update. I actually got the cursor to work. So we can check in the About This Mac page to see what this is about. We're actually on an, on an, an install disk or just a system disk. So it won't really tell us too much about it. But it does seem to work pretty well. Uh, other than the line still down here at the bottom, uh, I don't know how to fix that. But I might have to disassemble the actual screen itself to do that. But otherwise, the whole thing seems to work really well. Which is really cool. So, yeah. It's pretty neat. So even though I got it to boot and it, everything seems to be working well so far, I'm still unhappy about a couple of the thing issues that it still has. For example, it'll sometimes occasionally SADMAC when trying to boot up. The hard drive won't work. It won't run off the, the battery that I've put in it and a few other things. All right, so to the, conclude this video, um, the only we've only really gotten to sort of the same place. Now, um, the com after the board, after the second board wash I did, it doesn't have power, it doesn't have most of the power issues it used to have, where basically it, um, where basically you have to wait for it to start to show life. Now it'll show life no matter what when plugged in. It still won't run off the original battery, which is unfortunate, and, um, but I can get it to boot, but the trackball is a bit finicky and will only go horizontally, so we're gonna have to fix that in the next video. Also, the eject mechanism doesn't work on the floppy drive, so we're gonna have to try fixing that as well. Currently, it's booted off floppy, and it seems to work okay. And we also have to fix the case. Now, the case has some cracks in it, and the whole back part is like all destroyed and stuff, so we're gonna try gluing that together in a future in the future episode. And uh, otherwise, after doing some troubleshooting with the multimeter, or the voltmeter, this isn't a multimeter, it just reads voltage, but after doing some um, further tests with it, on the 68K MLA forms, everyone has concluded that my portable has an issue with the hybrid board, which is very unfortunate. And basically what the hybrid board is, is it's this little blue riser board on the Macintosh portable logic board that does all the power regulations, does all the power stuff. And unfortunately that board is so terrible when it was designed that it relies on, um, it relies on uh, the power brick or any other external power sources to give it the right amount of voltage. And because, and because something happened during this portable's life, um, it's, it's caused the board to fail. And also, the traces on, the, um, on that board um, could also be damaged from capacitor leakage because the traces are made out of like a, a graphite or something that, that cr um, corrodes away easier than the regular copper traces on the board. Um, that all circuit boards use so there could be a way to make a replacement PVC and then replace it because the physical components on the board aren't bad it's just the board itself is so yeah that's unfortunate we'll have to see what we're going to do with that and then finally the last thing that I wanted to talk about is that I might have to get a replacement battery and this is because someone told me that some of the issues that this portable has, like the restarting during startup and the and the weird line over no, that might be something else, but someone told me that the, the some of these random issues that it keeps having and some of the sad max may be due to the battery that I'm using. 
because my battery may not be fully compatible. And there is a battery company online to, that made the original Mac portable battery in the 80s, and this is the exact same type of battery it would have used. But unfortunately, it's $30, so if I really want to do it, then I'll have to do that. And I'm also thinking of putting a SCSI 2SD in the portable um, to replace the hard drive because the hard drive might be drawing too much power. So if I can find a SCSI 2SD um, and, it, uh, and it doesn't draw as much power as the original hard drive, then I could have it on a SCSI 2SD, which would be awesome. Now, the last thing I wanted to say is that I'm seriously considering buying another portable. There's a backlit portable on eBay, and apparently these don't actually have the hybrid board issues that the non-backlit models like this one have. So if I were to buy another one, uh, then it would be completely different. So we'll have to see what we're, what the future holds for this. But for now, on the agenda, we have the trackball repair, uh, floppy drive repair, case repair, possible SCSI to SD upgrade, possible hybrid board replacement, but otherwise, that'll conclude it for part two, and thank you all so much for watching. Uh, please leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you want to see more videos, and as always, thank you for watching.